Dr. Servez looked down at his now bandaged patient, and just earlier that morning, the father of cyborgs in the next Graham Bell had been laid on his table. His mind just kept circling back to the same spine-chilling thought. He shouldn't have done this. He asked himself, what have I done? So, so he just I want to talk about this story because this is absolutely wild. And I don't, I don't say that word lightly. I had to do something to stay a step ahead. I decided the best thing to do was to implant myself. So this is a story about Dr. Philip Kennedy. They call him the father of cyborg. He was the first person to ever successfully develop and implement a brain and computer interface. So big deal. His ultimate goal was basically to develop a method and a device that made it possible to completely digitize a person's thoughts. It was laying the foundation for the next generation to actually enhance normal humans. And the reason I think it's important to do that is because, I don't know if you know Ray Kurzweil, who's predicted that you know, machine intelligence will be at least equal and probably surpass human intelligence by 2045 which is a generation away. So Dr. Kennedy is an Irish neurologist, originally from Limerick, a city in Western Ireland. He is extremely smart, like extremely smart. He's also pretty eccentric. <laughs> Mixed together Derek Shepard from Grey's Anatomy with like the stereotypical mad scientist. You, you, this is, this is it. This is who you get, okay? He started his journey by attending medical school at the University of Ireland in Dublin, and his ultimate goal wasn't necessarily to become a doctor, it was more to become a researcher. He wanted to innovate, to invent things, he wanted to research more so than like to be a physician. He moves to Canada to start clinical work and decided to head to America, Chicago more specifically. Here is where he got his PhD in neuroscience. So like I said, he's very smart. <laughs> Not a lot of people can do that. Graduates with his PhD in neuroscience in 1983 and then he headed to Atlanta, Georgia where he would stay, settle down, move into an HOA controlled neighborhood. No, I'm just in reality, he was actually on his way to gaining titles such as the Indiana Jones of neuroscience and a disruptor. If you watched Glass Onion, you know? Also, people thought he was insane. A little bit. Just a little bit. By 1986, he finally got the chance to really discover what he was capable of as a neurologist and as a researcher. He got a position as a research scientist by a medical center at Georgia Tech. He finished his neurology residency a few years later. He was working in his own private clinic and also doing research for his own research company, Neural Signals. People have been trying to control computers with brains for as long as computers have existed. It's always been kind of confined to sci-fi movies and like doomsday conspiracy theorists. It's never really been something that seemed realistic in the past by any means. So this was his thing, you know? He was so interested in the idea of being able to digitize and upload, or upload wasn't, I don't think that was a word back then, but to be able to put the brain into a machine or to be able to control a machine using just your thoughts. Now, there was one other person who had had this idea and, you know, taken it seriously and worked towards it, and his name was Jose Delgado. He was Spanish, I think in Spain, and he basically created like a radio control device that could pick up neural signals in your brain and then deliver a little shock to your brain's cortex. It worked, you know? So in 1963, he showed this off in probably the most badass way ever with a bull. His objective was to see if stimulation of the bull's midbrain could short circuit the rage signals, stopping the bull before it reached the matador. And in mid charge, the button was pressed. The bull's aggression ceased instantly. Go bear, go home. Now, what he did was much more like trying to hotwire the brain. But since the brain is in a Kia Optima, it didn't really work out that well. In the long run. So this is where Dr. Kennedy realized this this is his thing. He's gonna do it. He's gonna make it he's gonna make it work. To figure all this out, he had to solve a pretty massive bioengineering problem. He had to make electrodes that would actually work in the brain and work long term. So he decided to put the tips of some Teflon gold wires inside of a little hollow glass cone and the same tiny little space he inserted one more critical component, which is a chemical cocktail that essentially mimics the actions of your sciatic nerve. It promotes neural growth. So this way, the electrodes and the brain would grow together and become one. He called his new little 
thing, the neurotropic electric. After this, he quit his job at Georgia Tech. He said, you know, I'm going off on my own now. I think I'm ready, guys. And he moved into his own new research company, which was Neural Signals. Around this point, he got FDA approval for his first human patient. And that was a very big deal. I mean, this was something that would be a total lifeline for people who had lost the ability to move and speak. So people who were essentially imprisoned in their own bodies, locked into their own bodies that no longer worked, but their brains worked. They, they were still there, but they were just stuck. That is, it's the most terrifying thing I could even imagine. And this would be an absolute life-changing thing for them. This would restore the ability for them to communicate. So he and his partner found a man who was willing to join this clinical trial and try this thing out. His name was Johnny Ray. And Johnny Ray was a 52-year-old drywall contractor and former Vietnam vet. He had suffered from a stroke and as a result of that was left completely paralyzed. He couldn't speak. The only way that he could communicate was by blinking. He would blink twice for yes and once for no. The only movements in any other muscles were his face would like twitch on occasion and his shoulder would twitch on occasion and that was it. And he was stuck like that, locked inside his own body. Horrifying. So first, they gotta put Johnny into an MRI machine. So they slide him into the MRI and they ask him to think about moving his arm. Not to move his arm because he can't move his arm, but to think about it. And when he thought about this, they looked and they saw what parts of his brain were lighting up in the MRI because they were active when he thought about moving his arm. It lit up like a Christmas tree and they looked and they were able to find that exact perfect spot. And when they found that perfect spot, this is where the implant was going to go and they were ready. So they surgically, you know, implanted the device into Johnny's brain. Then they worked with him multiple times a week for a little while. At this point in the training, he had switched to thinking of the cursor. And that was really important because it showed that the cortex, I guess, had embodied the cursor. It was now a cursor-related cortex. He was able to control a cursor on a screen using just his thoughts, which is so cool. That is amazing. That's insane. Certainly a lot happier now. I mean, when he realized that he could move the icon, and we asked him to, you know, to do it against the clock and speed it up, uh, he was able to do that, and he was very happy. Now, it could only move left and right, though. He couldn't move up and down. He could only move left and right. However, there was one thing they found, and that was that when he would twitch, when his shoulder would twitch, he'd click the mouse. Nuts. But he, yeah, so when his shoulder twitched, he could click the mouse. So what they did was they pulled a keyboard up on the screen, like a screen keyboard, and he was able to use his brain and his thoughts to move the cursor around the keyboard and then click on letters and communicate. He could write again, and this was huge. This was absolutely huge. So Johnny Ray, who was once imprisoned in his own body, locked inside of himself, was now typing with his mind. We were training him to spell his name. And he spelled his name and he didn't do very well. He uh, there's a whole ten letters in a row. There was a J, an O, an H, and an N in there. His name was John. And he's tried again. And he had about six letters, he improved. He tried again. And I think he had just one error and that was great. And each time we give him a rest. And we gave him a rest, so let's try again. And then he went totally wrong. He started to put in a P. It was supposed to be a J O H N. He'd always start with a J, then he did P H I L. He spelled my name, right? Just totally went off. And we thought, Johnny, what are you doing? Okay. So. Now this led to basically Dr. Kennedy getting a ton of positive recognition. He went on Good Morning America in 1999 and the Washington Post actually referred to him as the next Graham Bell. This like lit a fire under him. He knew this was going to be his focus. This was going to be the focus of his career. This so around that time, he actually got two more patients and he tried the implant on them and it didn't go as well. Not his fault, but just it just didn't work out. Around that same time that he was trying with these two new patients, other labs were starting to make progress with their brain control prosthetics. So what they were trying to do, rather than trying to produce speech, that they were trying to be able to move a prosthetic arm or move a prosthetic leg. And since Dr. Kennedy's new patient trials were unsuccessful and all of these new companies were coming out of the woodwork now because this thing had just moved from science fiction into reality and was now a thing that you could do, people started working on this a lot more. He had more competition and people were kind of thinking, you know, ultimately 
maybe it wasn't as great as they thought. So what Dr. Kennedy realized that he needed to be able to do was to create a brain computer interface that would allow someone to speak as smoothly as somebody who could helpfully normally speak. Because with the with the keys and with Johnny, he, he could type out words, but it was very, very slow. It took a lot of time. So if he could make a way for people to communicate pseudo normally, that would be perfect. He needed to figure out a way to do that. Trying to get his next patient for the trials. And he realized that a better way to do this would be to get somebody who was still able to speak, at least at the time of the operation. For the perfect patient for this would be somebody with like a neurodegenerative disease like ALS, who would eventually lose all bodily functions, but at the time of the surgery would have been able to still communicate. Because that would make testing, learning, researching, studying, and training the device and training him to work with the device way easier and much more likely to actually work. Right around this time though, the FDA actually revoked its approval for his implants. That didn't discourage him though. It was actually quite the opposite. He decided to do something unconventional. And so he thought to himself, you know, what the hell? I'll just put it in myself. Literally put it in him. It is his own brain. Put it in himself, literally. He wanted to do something to stay a step ahead. I decided the best thing to do was to implant myself say he's a bit eccentric. So, summer of 2014. Dr. Kennedy has decided that the only way to really advance his project was to make it very personal, to put it into his own head, and that would also make it way easier to learn and study, because obviously it's in his own brain. So, $30,000 in hand, he flies to Belize. Belize! And he had the help of two men, one named Paul Poughton, and then another, which was a local neurosurgeon named Joel Cervantes. But Poughton and Cervantes were the founders of Quality of Life Surgery, which was a medical tourism clinic. So people from other countries will go to Belize, go to this clinic to get procedures. So Dr. Kennedy, totally healthy, 66 years old, is getting ready for brain surgery, which is so scary. Anyway, he's ready and he does it. After 11 and a half hours on the table in surgery, he didn't have any bleeding. It seemed like everything had gone really smoothly. Once the anesthesia started to wear off, Dr. Cervantes went into the room and he held up his glasses for Dr. Kennedy to see and he asked him, what are these? And Dr. Kennedy just stared at them. And then he stared at the TV next to him and then he stared back at the glasses and silence. In these moments, I cannot even imagine how scared Dr. Cervantes would have been, but he tried to keep like looking calm. He didn't want to freak him out any more than he probably was already freaking out. So finally, he kept waiting. He's like, okay, take your time. Eventually, Dr. Kennedy started stuttering, stammering. He was making, he was making sounds, but they were not words. It was like very, very, very small pieces of words. It was completely incoherent, just very broken speech. And then, you know, Kennedy tries again, and he looks like he's trying to just use sheer willpower to make it to, to talk, and it just is not working. There's just nothing. Just more silence. So Dr. Cervez looked down at his now bandaged patient, and just earlier that morning, the father of cyborgs, Indiana Jones of neurosurgery, the next Graham Bell, had been laid on his table. His mind just kept circling back to the same spine-chilling thought that he shouldn't have done this. Waves of panic washed over him as he asked himself, what have I done? Over the next couple days, they realized how bad things actually were. His language problems stayed. He wasn't making sense at all. Dr. Kennedy could utter syllables and a few scattered words here and there but he seemed to have completely lost the ability to bring sounds into words and words into sentences. When Dr. Kennedy grabbed a pen, he tried to write a message. It just came out as just chicken scratch, completely illegible. The only thing he could do was apologize. The only word he could say fully was sorry. So he just kept saying, sorry, sorry, sorry. Two more days go by and Dr. Kennedy is sitting on his bed and all of a sudden his jaw started chattering and he started to kind of grind his teeth. And then one of his hands began to shake and he had a seizure. And this was one so bad that Poughton worried that he would break his teeth. He found himself in this horrifying new reality. And also the fact that he had essentially done this to himself. Poughton actually said, he said, I thought we had damaged him for life. 
I was like, what have we done? So then I'll butchered Kennedy moves into a guest house at Pouton's house and after he was cleared to leave the clinic. And this actually wasn't the plan. He was supposed to go back to Georgia, but with the complications that he was having, he wasn't able to travel himself. Pouton calls his fiance and says, you know, you need to come, come and get him because this is bad. And she basically said she was not sympathetic at all. She said, I tried stopping him, but he wouldn't listen. And okay, you know, I get that. I do like get that. But at the same time, you're engaged to this person. Like you love this person. This is a hell of a punishment for not listening to you. So he stays in the guest house. Um, Pouton would go out daily to visit him. So one day he goes out there and he brings him like a lime juice and they walk out to the garden together. Dr. Kennedy, surprisingly, said something. Apparently he let out like a contented sigh and he said, it feels good. And Pouton was just like, thank God. This was a, like a good sign. He still would struggle to find words for things. He would get things mixed up, he, but he was on the right track. He was showing progress. He was, it was seemed like this was not gonna be the end. So eventually the doctors cleared him to go home. At that point, he still did have to take anti-seizure medication for a few months. He had to wait for neurons to regrow, but bullet dodged. Massive, massive bullet dodged. So in October, a few months later, Kennedy decided to head back to Belize again for a second brain surgery. Well, thankfully, luckily that surgery actually did go fine. I returned home and was able to get started on the fun part now. Like I said, he wanted to research, he wanted to develop. So now he had this thing in his brain and it was this was like his focus, this was what he wanted to study and he was ready to get to work. Over the next seven weeks, he was still seeing patients and then after he was done with work, he would go to, I guess, work again and he would do research and he would run through all of his self-administered tests, test and research the new algorithm in his brain, but he did end up having to have the implant removed 188 days later. The incision never fully healed. The electrodes he used were like very big and bulky and it just wasn't possible for him to heal over it. So he essentially had to have it removed. However, the three little glass cones, they were left alone. So they'll stay in his brain for the rest of his life. It's like a memory within memories. Beautiful. The only lasting effects of this is that he can no longer move his left eyebrow and one side of his face does droop a little bit, but other than that, that's it. So he got extremely lucky, extremely lucky. He said this, this is a quote, he said, I think people overrate brain surgery as being so terribly dangerous. Brain surgery is not that difficult interesting take. So post self-inflicted brain surgery, this is what he says he is doing. He said helping ALS patients and locked in patients is one thing, but that's not where we stop. The first goal is to get speech restored. The second goal is to restore movement. And a lot of people are working on that. It'll happen. They just need better electrodes. And the third goal would be to start enhancing normal humans. Your brain will be infinitely more powerful than the brains we have now. We're going to extract our brains and connect them to small computers and that will do everything for us and our brains will live on. So the journalist who did this interview asked him if he was excited about that, like, you want that? And he said, yeah, oh my god, this is how we're evolving. So yeah, that is the story. I just thought this was so interesting because, first of all, like, I guess it I mean, I've never been in this situation where I've decided to electively undergo unnecessary brain surgery, but if I did, I think, I mean, the, the fact that things can go wrong is kind of like, very, obviously it's worst case scenario, but the stakes are so high when you're literally talking about brain surgery that to do that and then for things to go so wrong, he just, I mean, he got lucky. <laughs> I, that is just, that's why they say he's eccentric. Also, he's very into the sci-fi stuff. He actually wrote a book a couple years ago called 2051, and his book is about this man who is able to put his brain, connect his brain to a metal suit, essentially making a robot and moving out of his physical body and then going into this like robot body and being able to continue to live. That's like the basis of the book. So I think that is his like ultimate goal, but I don't know. Also, uh, I do want to kind of make a video talking about Neuralink because Neuralink is also crazy, but there's a lot of stuff there. There's a lot there. Um, and that'll, that'll be a project, but 
Anyway, thank you for watching. I hope this was good. Um, let me know what you think. Be safe out there.